In the last few videos, we've constructed different components of the transformer neural network, outlining the logic in code as well as in theory. Now, in this video, I'm just going to talk about the encoder part of the architecture in its entirety, and I'm going to basically blow up this architecture so that we can talk about each and every component and how we go from start to finish of the encoder. So real quick at a high level, when we want to perform translation, let's say from English to French, we take an English sentence, let's say it's my name is Ajay, that's actually my name, hi, pleasure to meet you. We then pass this into the transformer encoder. All of these are passed in simultaneously. And then these are going to be generating four vectors also generated simultaneously that correspond to my name is a J. Now these vectors actually better encapsulate the context of the word within the sentence and hence they're better representations of the meaning of the word, and hence they can be used into the decoder to assist in translation, so that the decoder knows which parts of the sentence to focus on when translating one word at a time. But how do we go from these English words to these really cool vectors? And that is exactly what I not so painstakingly just drew in this not so very complicated diagram over here. So this entire box is one encoder layer, and we repeat this like 12 times, but I'm gonna explain each and every component in it. So let's get started. So we first have the input sentence, my name is Ajay. Now, typically though, when we are actually training the network, we're going to be adding a padding token which is basically going to be a dummy set of tokens such that we have a consistent input, even though that the number of words in the sentence may change, we will always have a fixed number of vectors that we pass through the transformer. And so this is gonna be like some padding token. Now each of these is encoded into a one hot dimensional vector. So that is going to be, for example, my would be a set of zeros where the corresponding token that corresponds to the word my will be one. The same thing for name, then is, a j, and then we have a bunch of padding tokens will be the exact same one hot encoded vectors. Now you'll notice that this would be of shape max sequence length cross max sequence length, which is what we define to be the maximum number of words that we want to pass through the transformer architecture. These one hot vectors though, don't really encapsulate words in a very compressed space. And so in order to have more condensed vectors that actually incorporate better meaning, and so that we can compute distances between these vectors, we wanna transform them into actual embedding vectors that may not be so large. So for example, we might wanna translate it to 512 dimensional vectors. So each of these red rectangles corresponds to a vector of 512 dimensions. This green thing over here is what I've used to determine a transformation with learnable parameters. So in this case, we're going to be mapping each of these vectors, which will be of size of like the maximum sequence length in both directions. And each vector will be mapped to a 512 dimensional vector that encapsulates the initial meaning of the word, whatever primitive sense that means in this initial case. And these parameters are learnable via backpropagation that comes from the end of the decoder. Now to this initial word embeddings, we are going to add positional encodings. Now these positional encodings are a set of sine and cosine functions in order to determine each and every single one of these individual spots. Now, these encodings are not gonna be learned by the model. They are just predetermined, and we can just basically add this entire fixed set of value matrix to every single input that we receive. Now, why do we add positional encodings? It's because every single word here is passed in parallel, but when you're dealing with English sentences, the actual sequence of these tokens matter. And so using the sine and cosine functions that we use to populate these vectors, we can encode position, these vectors encode meaning, and so we will end up with another set of vectors that encode both meaning and position. 
And you see this, this white line is basically going to be the huge rectangle that is the start of the encoder layer that can be repeated. What you'll notice now is that each of these word vectors are going to be mapped to a query vector, a key vector, and a value vector. Each of them will be 512 dimensions each. And so we do this by passing it through the green squares here, which are learnable parameters of WQ, WK, and WV. And each of them will just return the maximum sequence length cross 512. And because this happens three times, we're going to see a max sequence length cross 1536. That's 512 times three. And so that is the Q, K, and V vectors. And we're gonna split this into eight heads. So let me just actually scroll here just to see exactly how that looks. So for example, when we take the initial set of vectors, we pass it into WQ. This is the max sequence length. We'll have, I've kind of transposed the vectors. So this is my name is a J. And this is basically, this side is going to be max sequence length. And this vertical direction here is going to be 512 dimensions. We now split this up into eight parts. That's one for each head. What attention heads do is basically it kind of adds like an additional batch dimension or it acts like in code when you actually code it out like another batch dimension so that there's parallel processing that goes on. And these heads can eventually interact with each other to get better context of the data. So it's faster and also helps get better context. And that's why we use multi-head attention versus just the single head. And so we end up with the same kind of vectors for query, for key, and for value. Now the query vectors, essentially for every word, the query vector is what I am looking for. The key vector on the other hand is what can I offer? And the value vector here is what I actually offer. And you'll notice that the key and the value vectors are very similar. It's just that during when we actually compute attention a little later, you'll kind of see the difference of where they are used, where one is used versus the other. And so what you'll notice here is that each of these little squares is going to be 512 divided by eight. So they're like little 64 dimensional vectors that we now compute attention with. So let's just scroll here to the top and then keep continuing along our path here. And so what we'll take here is that we'll have the maximum sequence length, that is the maximum number of words that we can pass into the transformer, cross 64. That will be one query matrix for one head that we now pass into this first uh, square with an X, which is basically a, a matrix multiplier. So I pass this query tensor right into here. And then I also pass in this first head of the key tensor, which is also max sequence length cross 64. We pass both of these in, and what we're going to get is this little square. This square is an attention matrix. The dimensions of this attention matrix are gonna be the max sequence length cross the max sequence length. So that's going to be like, because this Q vector is going to be max sequence length cross 64 times the transpose of this key vector, which is 64 cross the max sequence length. And so we get max sequence length cross max sequence length. And now this gives us a little matrix that we call uh, almost, it's not the complete attention matrix, but it is an attention matrix so that we're able to kind of have a relationship between every word in the sentence with every word in the same sentence. So this is kind of the primitive form of the self-attention matrix. And you can see that we have this multipli this little multiplier for every single head. So the second one over here is multiplying the second entire query tensor with this entire query tensor for the key. Same thing with the third. And we have the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth. So that would be eight heads. And for each of them, we are going to get eight of these attention matrices. And you can kind of see, I've written a little note too at the bottom for each matrix, it's max sequence length cross max sequence length. 
We'll now basically pass each of these matrices individually into a softmax function, where we're first going to first divide it by the square root of the dimensions, that is 512 in this case, like dk. dk is like the dimension of, um, you know, these k vectors, which is 512, but it's the same as the dq, like the, the value vector and the query vector basically scaling by a constant and then applying a soft max. We are dividing by a constant here to better stabilize the values for better training. And then we are applying a soft max so that we actually can compare these values to see how much attention every single word should be paying attention to every other word in that sentence. And it's eventually these squares over here that will give us the actual attention matrices, or more specifically, the self-attention matrices, where every value represents like a probability. We now take each of these attention matrices and we pass them each head through these multipliers here. And what we're multiplying actually comes from the value vector that we computed before. And this is where the difference comes in between the key and the value. So the key is used to compute the attention matrix itself, but the value vector is applied as a multiplier on the final attention matrix itself. So I hope that distinction makes more sense. So we'll take the attention matrix, which is max sequence length cross max sequence length, we will now multiply that by every single value tensor, which is max sequence length cross 64 for every head. And then we were going to end up with basically max sequence length cross 64 tensors. And we end up with like eight of them, one for each attention head. And if you look here, that's kind of exactly also the note that I've written down here. And once we actually perform some concatenation, we're gonna concatenate them all together so that we have a max sequence length cross 512 dimensional vectors. And now just to see where these 500, where these max sequence length 512 dimensional vectors are, we can actually look back into this diagram over here where we've done the input embedding, the positional encoding. We have the query, the key and the value. That's why we see three arrows here, one for query key and value. We did our multi-head attention already, and we're actually like right here in the in between this orange box and this yellow box. We're actually right there where we have this 512 dimensional vector and for every single like sequence. So that's like the max sequence like cross 512 dimensions, just for perspective. Now you can see from this graph, the next thing we wanna do is add and normalize. So we want to add basically whatever we get the result here, along with a residual connection. That's what we call this little skip connection or residual connection. And then we want to perform some layer normalization on it. So the reason that we have residual connections is to ensure that for very deep networks, the back propagation of values will eventually or might lead to very, very small gradients. This is because the activations that are used like ReLU, GELU, ELU, all of these have values that are either zero or there are neurons that can take like near zero activations. And if you try to take the gradient of these very small values, it's going to be even smaller. And that gradient value is gonna decrease as we go further and further back in the network, which for longer, deeper networks, it can eventually become zero. And if the gradients become zero, no parameters are updated properly and the network does not learn. So to prevent that for, for these longer networks, we tend to use these residual connections and hence we are using them here. Why are we using layer normalization? It is mostly because that we want to perform stable training. The values that we might get from, you know, after multi-head attention and applying it to the value vector may be, you know, may have like a quite a wide standard deviation and also a scattered mean. But with layer normalization, we can ensure that these values are centered around like zero, maybe standard deviation around one. And also there are thus like even steps. It's easier to take even steps during the learning process. And so training hence becomes more stable with layer normalization. Now that we have an understanding of why that happens, we can kind of take this 
set of matrices. And you can see that there's like an addition here. And I've put this like in a square as well as an addition operation that we're adding with something that comes here. This is actually going to be the initial positional vector encoding that we saw in the very beginning of this encoder layer. To see exactly where it is, let me just zoom back out. You can see that this goes all the way back to where we actually computed our positional encodings here. And that's also like a max sequence length cross 512. Apologies if it's not super clear, um, but essentially it's just like very hard to zoom out. But I hope that this entire thing still makes sense where we're adding matrices of the same dimension to each other in order to get the add, you know, there's the add and norm, this is the addition part. And then after that, we're gonna perform layer normalization. So let's just scroll back in here. So when we perform layer normalization, we are basically going to, let me just scroll here. We're going to be stabilizing these values as much as possible. And so we're going to essentially have the same vectors just with more stable values here. The only difference though, is that I've labeled this in green to indicate that there are learnable parameters here as well. Now, the learnable parameters can be a set of gammas and betas. Now, I've put this as like 512 pairs of gammas and betas that are there, but honestly, this doesn't have to be the case. You can have as few as just like one gamma and beta for the entire thing, or a gamma and beta for every single uh, part or every single like layer in our case, and that hence the name of layer normalization. But honestly, this is left to implementation details itself and it's not like super crucial. As long as you have like, if you're doing layer normalization across a batch, you might need to also be wary of your batch size. Just a, a tidbit and caution. But essentially we're going, after layer normalization, we're going to get much more stable values. And we're going to now pass this into a set of like a linear layer with activation and dropout. Now the linear layer is going to help better interactions, especially among the heads. We had eight heads that we simply just concatenated. This linear layer is going to help basically push them, all these heads to kind of interact with each other across the layers. ReLU is an activation function that helps the network understand better and more complex patterns. And dropout allow, it's basically a sense of like turning off neurons within our feed forward layer just randomly so that the network is better able to generalize and it makes sure that the network doesn't like specifically memorize a, a specific kind of pattern. Now, if we say that like the, this linear layer is like it maps 512 neurons to 1024 neurons, we're basically going to get each vector here of like, you know, each sequence, each word is gonna be represented by then like a 1024 dimensional vector. That's kind of what I've written here. We then pass this into another linear layer where we just compress it back to its 512 dimensions. And we're going to use our good old friend, the skip connection to add basically what we had from the output of the previous case. That's, let me just go back to the zoomed out view so we can see what we're doing. We're again now at this phase where we're adding basically the output of the feed forward layers that we just computed and also the skip layer that we did from the previous added norm. So we have this residual connection, which we do here. And then we are going to now take this resulting network and we'll perform layer normalization to better stabilize these values. And so we'll just end up with the, for every single sequence, we'll still end up with 512 dimensions. And each of these correspond to a word. Now, one thing to note is that these final words, like I mentioned before, now have better contextual awareness because they've passed through this entire network that encompasses attention. They also, you know, help preserve signals via skip connections. They are also much more stable values via layer normalization. And so these values are just overall, like each vector is just better encompassing and a better representation of the words than compared to like what the initial vectors that we passed into this network were. Now, because language here is just so complicated, we actually execute all of these kinds of roles multiple times over. In fact, you'll see that we execute it like 12 times here. 
all of these operations just can cast can cascaded one after the other after the other and so that just helps us get like the best vectors that represent were english words at the end this is required because like english is just such a complex language and now when we have all of these vectors we can eventually like pass all of these now into the decoder that'll now assist in translation from english to let's say french another language so that's going to do it for explaining this architecture for the encoder network and i hope all of this made sense i also have like a good amount of code too that kind of illustrates this as well i was just like writing this out and it's pretty fun um also printing out the shapes of each layer so that we can see what's going on but i think i'm going to illustrate this actually in another video since this one is getting too long so if you want to join me in this journey of constructing a transformer neural network from scratch then please do hit that subscribe button please do give this a like and also do comment what your thoughts are on this and whether you have also tried using transformers because there's so many cool things that are happening today with like chat GPT and also new language models that were introduced by like meta AI and so many other places too that are just cropping up. So this is super exciting. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in another video. Bye-bye.